Uh, good morning. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Rowett for inviting me today and uh, Dr. Marenstein for suggesting it, Jocelyn for helping coordinate the trip. Um, most of the research that I do is around nutrition. I'm actually going to be talking to Dr. Marenstein's class uh, about that later. I understand that this session is mostly um, or historically about health services research. So we're going to talk about health services research today um, and specifically health services research that occurs outside the walls of hospitals and clinics and academic health centers uh, and go out into the community a little bit. Um, this is actually a piece that was just published last week. Um, it's a brief uh, summary of what I'm going to talk about today and may touch on some topics that I don't get to, so if anyone's interested. But what I'd ultimately like to get to today uh, is a discussion about my K award uh, and the research I'm doing around the food environment. I think I should spend a little bit of time on the rationale for that work, though, so you can understand why I'm doing what I'm doing. I seem to be working in an area that's not familiar to many people. Uh, and I think uh, I'm going to spend a fair bit of time on the background so you can get some grounding and really understand uh, the importance of this work. So we'll see how far we get to. I have uh, no financial interests or disclosures. Um, and I understand that most of the audience is med students and residents, uh, some faculty members. Uh, I think you all see patients, or many of you do. You may talk to them about diet, nutrition, and when you do, it might feel a little something like this, or maybe even more like this. Because when they leave your office, they have to navigate this, and this, and this, and this. Um, and these are just some shots from the Bronx uh, where I see patients um, and uh, have my practice. And I think the images really make the point that food environments can really challenge uh, doctors' advice to eat healthfully and patients' best intentions to follow that advice. And I love this quote from David Williams of Harvard. Uh, from a few years back, what if we treat illness and then send them back to the same conditions that made them sick in the first place? Uh, another relevant quote comes from the National Academy of Medicine, where I was at this meeting earlier in the fall, and I'll make this uh, a little clearer for you. Most chronic diseases and conditions are a normal response by normal people to an abnormal environment. So let's talk about the environment. Who can tell me what that's a picture of? What is it? Right, so that is a produce aisle <laughs> of a supermarket in an urban low-income minority neighborhood. Uh, actually happens to be a couple blocks from my residency practice where I was in Philadelphia, and if I put that on a map, it's right there at point B. And if you go up the road a couple miles, you get to point A, which is the supermarket a couple blocks from where I live during residency, and the produce aisle there looks like this. I think this, um, you know, this map and these images makes the point that environment may matter. And how many of you are familiar with this uh, figure? Anyone seen this before? Right. So this comes from Tom Frieden, uh, former director of the CDC, uh, former commissioner of health of New York City. And what it shows is different uh, initiatives in health and in public health uh, and their relative effort and impact. So here we are, you know, as um, clinicians in the rooms with patients, counseling them, providing dietary advice, telling them what they should be eating. Uh, and that takes a lot of effort, a lot of effort on our part, a lot of effort on the patient's part, and maybe doesn't have a lot of impact. So even when we're effective, which is not often, we affect one patient at a time. So maybe we get you know, more bang for the buck, operating on more fundamental causes. Um, but socioeconomic factors are hard to intervene on. So maybe we do almost as well at this stage, which is in modifying the environmental context or changing the context in which behavioral decisions are made. So Tom Frieden and I are not the only ones that have that idea. So this is a plot of papers, articles, research that's been published in the food environment space over time. Uh, and what you can see is there's just been an explosion of interest in this area. So just kind of this exponential increase, uh, you know, right around 10 years ago. And this is about where I got into the game. So being a part of this rapid proliferation, I've seen kind of all the warts and all the limitations and all the problems with this research in this area, and it's gotten me to ask the question, why is everybody in such a hurry to get the wrong answers? So to illustrate, let's take a, um, a parent controversy. Um, so this came out in the New York Times a couple years after I got into the business uh, by Gina Collada. And it was a paper questioning the existence or the relevance of food deserts. So who's heard the term food desert? Okay, what is a food desert? 
anybody just yeah. shout it out. It's an area where there's not healthy food yeah. that's accessible to people. Good, very good. So area without healthy food, it's variably defined depending on uh, who you're talking. Excuse me, who you're talking to. Uh, some people define it as just an absence of supermarkets, but yeah, absence of healthy food. And so, what this New York Times piece did was highlight, you know, two recent peer-reviewed publications that said, really, the, the food environment doesn't matter. Where grocery stores, supermarkets are doesn't matter. There doesn't seem to be a relationship with what people are eating or with downstream health implications like BMI or body weight, right? So no food doesn't. But then that very same month, in the journal Obesity, came a paper that seemed to come to the opposite conclusions, that supermarkets and grocery stores did matter, and when they were absent, people had higher BMI. So what was going on? So I thought I knew um, what was happening here, and so I sent a letter to the New York Times, and like all the letters I sent to the New York Times, that one was unceremoniously not accepted. <laughs> um, and so I sent a letter to the editor of the journal Obesity, and at the blazing rate of academic publishing that came out a year later, uh, which didn't wind up being a problem um, because the problems were still uh, very much at play then. And in fact, I expanded that piece to do kind of a full review of the literature and a narrative, um, uh, a narrative commentary. And that came out two years later, and uh, the issues were still at play and maybe even worse. Um, and I'd say that's still the case today. So what I'm going to do today is talk about just three of the issues that I discussed, and this is going to be sort of um, uh, an agenda for moving through the next part of the talk. Uh, these are just uh, three of the several issues on the list, but I think they illustrate uh, some of the complexity here and some of the things that get ignored and some of the reasons why I think people are getting this wrong. So let's start with number one, uh, unvalidated business list. So let's say um, you're a researcher and you wanted to define the food environment. You wanted to say, what are the sources of food people have access to? What are they exposed to? and you want to do that quickly and efficiently and maybe without even leaving your office, how would you do that? Google, Google Maps. Huh? Yeah, Google Maps, right? So these are, I don't even know if you know what these are. So these are books. <laughs> um, so these were uh, something that we read before there were screens and e-readers. Uh, but these are actually yellow pages, right? So they're business directories. So now we go to Google Maps or some other online directory, but the point is there's some listing, right? There's some data that's collected for other purposes that tell you information about the stores, restaurants, other sources of food that are available, where they are, and you can look at that. And so, you know, if this is an actual street in any town USA, and you look and a business list tells you what the street looks like, that's great, right? But what if the business list looks like that? So then we've got an issue, right? So you've got, you know, CVS where CVS should be, and you've got the New York Deli where the New York Deli should be. But then over here, you got Jim's Bodega versus Joe's Bodega. Right, so is Jim's the same as Joe's? I don't know, maybe. Uh, so we give that a cautionary check. And then over here, you got Burger King versus Taco Bell. Um, yeah, my laser pointer. Right. And so you know, clearly those are two different fast food franchises, but to the extent that fast food might contribute equally to people's food environment, maybe we give those the same. So we give those a cautionary check. But then the rest of this, you see, you got difference, and these are different, and that's different. And so there's some discrepancy here. So you went from something that was like 100% accurate to something that was uh, about you know, half accurate, about 50%. And so you can do this. You can actually go out on the ground and see how well these business lists operate. And just like you would validate any other test in clinical medicine, you have your gold standard test on the top, which here is ground observation, your candidate test, which here is um, looking at the business list, and you see how well it performs. You guys have seen two by two tables before? You've heard? sensitivity and positive predictive value. So sensitivity in this case is just how well the business list, how well the listing, how often it identifies a food source when it's actually there. And positive predictive value is how often, uh, how often food that's actually there is actually found in the business list, right? And so ideally you want both of those to be 100%, which would be the first scenario that we show. Um, now the thing is, no one had really done this. Uh, and people were using these business directories quite a bit and still are. Um, and so we said, let's go out into the streets of the Bronx and see how well this thing performs. What does it look like? How does it um, compare to actual to the actual sexual situation on the street? So what do you think we found? So remember, so 100% is perfect. Zero would be complete random. What do you think we got in terms of numbers? Well, I'm hearing 80, 70. 
30. 30. 30. Wow. Us missing a row. <laughs> uh, so we got in this range. So sensitivity, positive for a big event. Now that's bad, uh, but that's actually being generous. So that's saying Jim's bodega is the same as Joe's bodega and Taco Bell is the same as Burger King. So that's being lenient. If we're strict, we do more along the lines of what the pessimist said. Right? So this, so I want to emphasize, this is used in dozens and dozens of studies in the published literature. And so just that misclassification alone, you know, makes the point that, you know, you do almost as well just flipping a coin. And so really businesses poorly represent the actual situation on the ground and really are an inadequate substitution for, you know, spending some shoe leather and going out and seeing what's out there. And so that fact alone could explain a lot of the discrepancy that we looked at in the New York Times piece, right? And so we published on that in 2013. And that was just issue one. So there's more to come. Um, so more to come. So what's next? So the other thing is limited range of food sources and food sources that are measured poorly. So this is a, um, this is a uh, graph showing the relative proportion or percentage of studies and where they're focused in the food environment. You can see the vast majority are focused on food stores and restaurants. And really within that, the vast majority are focused on supermarkets and fast food outlets. And that's true of all of the studies, the two in the New York Times and the one in the obesity article that we responded to. Um, and most of those studies call supermarkets healthy and fast foods unhealthy. What's, what's the problem with that? Supermarkets have a lot of unhealthy. Supermarkets what? They have a lot of unhealthy. Yeah, not only do they have a lot of them, they're the predominant source. That's where most people get most of their junk food. And likewise, fast food outlets don't always sell a lot of garbage, right? There's salads, there's milk, cut through. Um, so, so that, you know, that, that's an, a, an, a, another issue, right, which could explain some discrepancy, kind of misclassification. Um, that's not what I want to focus on now. So what I want to focus on now is the fact that people are only focusing on supermarkets and fast food or only on stores and restaurants. Um, but I was, you know, I came in yesterday and I went down to the mall and there were some other food sources down near the mall. And there are other food sources, you know, when I get off the subway in New York City. And what are those? What do those look like? Yeah, so that's what it looks like in DC. These are pictures from yesterday. And that's what it looks like in New York City. So how is no one talking about this? That's crazy, right? So we said we should talk about this. We should see what this looks like. So street vendors. So we went out on the streets in New York, uh, or in the Bronx, and we found like almost 400 street vendors in the Bronx. And it turned out, uh, you know, about a quarter of them were selling, you know, healthier stuff like fresh produce and water. Um, but the majority of them, three quarters, were selling, you know, snow cones and candy bars and salty chips and, you know, hot dogs and, uh, you know, greasy ethnic fare. Um, and it turned out that that differed quite a bit by neighborhood. So this is just looking at uh, green carts, which are vendors, uh, mobile vendors that are uh, set up to sell whole, fresh, unprocessed produce only. And so the idea is to get produce in the neighborhoods that need. Uh, and you can see that these are the dots representing where the green cards are, and you can see they're not uh, evenly dispersed across the borough. They're kind of bending on top of one another, and that's what these um, clouds demonstrate. They represent the clustering. Um, so it, the, the clouds show where vendors are, but equally as important are these white spaces, these kind of green card deserts that are not being uh, reached, right? That, they're, that people, are, um, people are not having access to green cards in these areas. So, so there's difference by neighborhood, and that's highlighted even further when we look at um, mobile carts in general, right? So this is not just looking at green carts, we're looking at all the food carts across the Bronx. Um, and I should say here, you guys are in medicine, um, I think the Bronx looks a little bit like an anatomical heart. Um, and so I often refer to it as the heart of darkness, because it's where all the bad stuff occurs. Um, so it's the least healthy um, county in New York State, it's the poorest congressional district in the country. And it has some of the um, you know, worst uh, health outcomes you can imagine. Uh, and if it is the heart of darkness, then this area right here is the left ventricle, right? And this is where all the action is. And those are actually the most challenged and disadvantaged neighborhoods within the Bronx, which has some heterogeneity. And all I want to convey on this map is that this is where you know, the street vendors are kind of evenly distributed across the borough in the summer, right? But it's a seasonal phenomenon. And in the winter, most of them are coming out here into the left ventricle which happens to be the neighborhoods that are the poorest communities with the highest Hispanic residents. And just to show you what that looks like statistically, it's a very busy slide. I'm not going to go through in detail, but uh, I want to demonstrate 
some correlations with diet, diet-related health, and demographic features. So this is looking at less healthful vending, so the vendors of you know, candy, chips, soda, hot dogs, um, cheesesteaks, that kind of stuff, um, per capita in neighborhoods. And what we showed was that the more or less healthy vendors there were, the lower people's fruit and vegetable consumption, the higher their sugary sweetened beverage consumption, higher their BMI, more diabetes, more dyslipidemia, more hypertension, and all these correlates with these demographic features. And that was you know, strongly true in the summer, less so in the winter, although it became more um, strongly associated and more significant for the uh, below the federal poverty level in Hispanic neighborhoods. Um, so the point here is just, uh, you know, we've, we've published on this extensively at this point now, um, but the point is that food, um, street vendors probably matter, they probably shouldn't be discounted, and they are one example of how food sources in a community extend well beyond supermarkets and restaurants. All right, so not just food stores, not just restaurants, there's also street vendors, what else? So there's um, farm to table initiatives, there's farm to school initiatives, are there any farm to street kind of things happening here in DC? What does that look like? There's an organization called Martha's Table that does like community gardening and then um, Oh, push. Push. okay, great, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so yes, there are a lot of those programs and even in some urban areas and you know in the Bronx it looks like this. So this is one of the farmers markets in the Bronx. So farmers markets, how is no one talking about farmers markets? Well, it turns out there are a bunch of farmers markets in the Bronx. Um, but notably, in the Bronx, a large proportion of what the farmers markets are selling, so a full third on average, is like highly refined, processed, not so helpful products. So things like pies, and jams, and jellies, and pastries, and donuts, and ciders, and juice drinks, right? Um, and it, you know, some farmers markets that represented 50% of what they're offering. And here's what that looks like. So this is like the largest farmers market in the Bronx. It looks so nice and green um, because it's actually in the botanical garden. So it's like the nicest, greenest part of the Bronx. Everything else is sort of concrete jungle. But um, so pies, right? Big sign for pies. Huge buckets of like juices and ciders and sugar sweetened beverages, um, brownies, scones, croissants, cookies, and a whole range of stuff that. If it did come from a plant, it came from the industrial manufacturing kind and not the living botanical kind, right? Um, and so those were often the best sellers and often the most promoted items too. And so you know, it makes the point that these farmers markets may be you know uh, offering and promoting items that are less than ideal for good nutrition and health. And there's some pretty big variation by neighborhood. And I'm not going to get into those details here, but we did publish on that and compare what they were offering to nearby stores. Um, looking at you know produce variety and quality um, and pricing, um, and so if you're interested, that's published. But the point is, is that they probably matter too. All right. So what are the other what are other sources in the environment? What else can people think of where there's food available that's beyond these four things listed here? Hmm? Are convenience stores already common in markets? They can be by some people's reckoning, so that's good. So expand on that. What do you, what else besides convenience stores? All right. Anyone else? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Food yeah. banks. Food banks. All right. I'll get to that momentarily. Yes, that is another excellent, good point. Yeah. And then stores like the dollar stores. And dollar yeah. Have a lot of food. It's a good point. How about your pharmacy? How about your dollar store? How about your sporting goods store? Your auto shop. Your quickie loop. Your laundromat. And every other retail outlet you can think of. That has that, you know that aren't usually conceived of as food stores, um, but that often have highly processed, prepackaged, salty snacks, you know, sugary candy, and like frozen confections. So food is ubiquitous; it is everywhere. And there are these other businesses, right? There are these businesses that are out in the landscape selling stuff that no one's really counting. So we looked again at the Bronx, right, heart of darkness, up at the top. Uh, and compared it to this area of Manhattan, the Upper East Side, which is a very affluent white community. Uh, and so we wanted to see what the difference was looking at, you know, all businesses in general, or street, I shouldn't say all businesses, we looked at all storefront businesses um, in the Bronx versus the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And these are just kind of, you know, some example streets. So this is what the Bronx looks like, and this is what Upper East Side of Manhattan looks like. And there are big differences in retail density and the number and percent of businesses offering food or drinks. So in the Bronx, 
20% of other businesses on the streets that we looked at, so one in five, offered something to eat or drink. Whereas in Manhattan, it was closer to uh, you know, one in 15 or 7%. Um, not only that, of the ones that did offer food or drink in the Bronx, a higher percentage offered only less helpful options, meaning if you were gonna get some food or drink there, the only option available to you was something you know, sugary, sweet, highly processed, prepackaged, something not so good. Do you have a question? No, oh, I, I thought someone was saying that. Okay. Anyone have a question? No. Um, so that's not so good. So this is what it looks like. Um, so this is a you know locksmith safe gates, right? The last place you'd probably expect to see food or want to eat something from looking at the outside. Um, but you know, inside you've got your sugar sweetened beverages, your salty snacks, your candies. Um, here's a laundromat. So a place you go to wash your clothes, you might expect to buy detergent, fabric softener, dryer sheets. You probably wouldn't expect a full deli counter. Um, this is a doctor's office. That is a um, vending machine for sugar sweetened beverages right in the waiting room. I did not anonymize that, so if you blow it up, you can see where that is and who that is. Um, so these are in the works. So we've got uh, three, uh, two revised and resubmits and one nearing completion, so this should be out uh, soon, but it makes the point that food is everywhere, right? It's really ubiquitous. Um, and so there are other businesses. Now someone made the point about food banks and food pantries. We also looked at that. Um, so those are out there too and are an important source, um, a disappointingly unreliable source and difficult to access source, but a source of emergency food for some of our most needy patients and mostly it's this you know, shelf stable, highly processed, prepackaged, less than nutritionally ideal uh, fare. Uh, we did look at that. Uh, and then of course there are vending machines. We've looked at those um, and other minor sources, but you know, there's school and there's food in the schools, there's food in the workplace. Well, we've looked at that. Um, the other thing that we've looked at, not food sourcing, we looked at food advertising, right? And this study in particular, we looked at advertising on the subway <coughs> system. So we wanted to see what, what, you know, not only what the source of food were, but what the messages were to eat them. And what we found was that advertising for less helpful foods, so things like you know, candy and beer and processed products and sugary breakfast cereals were disproportionately placed in stations home to um, you know, minorities and immigrants in, in languages other than English and you know, directed at children. Um, and this is actually my proudest work to date. So as opposed to getting put in some journal that no one reads, this one actually helped affect policy. So part of the unhealthy food that we looked at, health, unhealthy food and beverage, uh, was alcohol advertising. And we showed disproportionate placement of alcohol ads in these vulnerable communities, pretty much targeted marketing, um, you know, proven by statistics. Um, and that really helped support a campaign to ban alcohol advertising on the whole Metropolitan uh, Transit Authority. So as of uh, this year, that is uh, passed unanimously. Uh, and so that's like some, you know, some good work that came out of it. So that's like, you know, a rare and proud moment in public health where like some evidence helped shift. Oh, like people actually cared about the facts, which was, Refreshing, <laughs> <laughs> unusual. Uh, anyway, so the point of all this work, um, and this was actually my opening line for uh, International Food Prize. So foods and beverages are nearly ubiquitous today. With placement and promotion of cheap, highly palatable, ultra-processed, unhelpful, convenience and impulse items just about everywhere, even in unexpected places and particularly directed at vulnerable groups. Um, so that's kind of the bottom line from that, but the point is, right, like, so the food sources are well beyond supermarkets and fast food outlets, right? So those two issues there alone explain a lot of the discrepancy that we talked about in the New York Times and obesity. All right, third issue I want to talk about is this one. You guys know what GIS is? Geographic information sensors, so just mapping, cartography, uh, looking at how things relate spatially on the ground, so where things are. So let's look at a map. So this is uh, Manhattan. Uh, the top part of Manhattan is the Bronx, and we'll drop a point here, right here in Harlem, okay? So, if you have a patient who lives in Harlem, and you want to know what foods they have access to, what is their food environment, you have to conceptualize that in some way. Uh, the most common way that people do that is just to say, well, let's say we'll walk out some arbitrary distance, let's say a mile, and we'll draw a circle, and we'll say, you know, everything within that mile is what that patient has access to, that's their food environment. And that's actually the method that was used in all of the papers um, that I noted earlier, the, the New York Times paper and the OBC paper. All right, well, it turns out in that person's environment, 
is this store right here, which happens to be a very nice Trader Joe's uh, across the river in New Jersey. And so the only way that that patient can get to that Trader Joe's is to buy a canoe and paddle across the river and then paddle back with groceries or you know, take the six mile drive up the parkway, across the GW bridge, back down, across some of the worst traffic in the country, uh, and pay $15 for the privilege. Um, so, you know, ludicrous, right? I mean, just like picture at a glance shows you how preposterous that is, and yet that's the predominant way that this is being done in the literature. Um, to make, you know, put a kind of finer point on that, um, this is the same environment looked at in three different ways, so three different ways of assessing access. So just to orient you, uh, the orange square here is someone's home, where someone lives. It could be the person who lives uh, in Harlem, like we talked about, or here in one of the wards of DC. Um, the gray lines and the hash marking are the existing street network, okay, where the roads go. Blue lines a river. Uh, these are meant to represent train tracks or divided highway or some barrier that you wouldn't cross, right, where the lines don't, where the roads don't go across. Um, the apples here are meant to represent some source of healthy food, you know, be a supermarket or a produce, green grocer, whatever. Hamburgers are meant to represent some source of unhealthy food. Um, there are triangles. The triangles here are um, the non-intuitive food sources, so the dollar stores, the uh, Jiffy Lubes, the you know pharmacies, right? So when they're open, they're not counted. When they're closed, they're counted. Uh, the diamonds are represent, meant to represent the unhelpful street vendors, so the hot dog stand, the cotton candy guy, the ice cream truck. Uh, again, when they're open, they're not counted. When they're closed, they're counted. All right? So this is a simple exercise. All you have to do is, you know, figure out what the exposure is and then count up the helpful and unhelpful food sources. So again, this is the predominant method. This is the one that was used uh, in the studies we talked about on the last slide. So we draw a circle. Now in this case, we're only looking at this part of the circle because this is, we're gonna say is a county line or some kind of border. And you know, we're in New York state and we don't care about what's happening in New Jersey and we're not getting funding to look at that. So we're only gonna look on our side. All right, so let's count it up. So we got one, two, three apples and nothing else. So we got three healthy versus zero unhealthy. All right, so this is great, this is a healthy environment even though all of those healthy sources are across train tracks where this person cannot get to. All right, so healthy environment. Now, another way to look at this is just take some arbitrary geopolitical boundary like a zip code or a census track or a county line or whatever. So let's say this is someone's zip code and so we put the zip code shape file down and then we look at everything in the zip code. Well here, again, same environment. We got one apple, two apples, and we got one hamburger, two hamburgers, and nothing else. So now we're two versus two. So we went from something healthy to something kind of neutral. And now we're gonna look and let's say, we're not gonna draw these arbitrary shapes, but we're gonna say, let's walk along the street network, network some distance and look at what people can access on the streets that they can walk along, right? So we'll go like a mile or a half mile or something along the streets that people can walk and we see that they, you know, they're not crossing train tracks, they're not crossing rivers, they're staying on the roads and they have access to one, two, three hamburgers. And in this case, we're gonna count the you know, dollar stores and we're gonna count the street vendors. And so we go uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So now we got zero healthy, eight unhealthy, right? Same environment, nothing different. The only thing we change is how we conceptualize access. And so you can see very clearly how there could be discrepancy in the literature just based on that alone. Problem. So, um, so I looked at this and said, we have to do better. So uh, after four submissions over three years to two institutes by one investigator, me, the NIH finally agreed to give me some money. Uh, and I got a five-year award that started uh, about three years ago, so I'm uh, just over halfway done. And this is what I wanted to address, the key problem. This is what I laid out on my specific games page, right? So the problems we just talked about, the pre-existing data sets, the limited range of food sources, the problematic exposures of, uh, uh, problematic measures of exposure, and then we also talked about the healthy versus unhealthy, right? Like supermarkets aren't necessarily healthy, fast food's not necessarily unhealthy. The thing we didn't talk about is looking at sources in isolation. So it's not just how many um, fast food outlets are in your neighborhood, but it's how many fast food outlets there are relative to everything else that's there the supermarkets, the grocery stores, the, the farmer's markets, you know, the, the food trucks. 
So I said, well, let's fix this. So rather than using uh, existing data sets, let's go out on the street and see what's there. Let's use direct observation. And let's not just consider a limited range. Let's look at everything, see what the food sources are. And don't look at these arbitrary geopolitical shapes. Let's walk the roads that people have access to. And let's categorize food sources by what they actually sell. Right? Not by their, whether they're a supermarket or a fast food outlet, but if they offer fresh fruit or if they offer nuts or if they offer like water. Uh, and then let's look at all of them relative to everything else, right? Let's consider the symphony out there, not the individual string instrument. Uh, so these are specific games, so to conduct a comprehensive assessment of the local food sources, and then to integrate that into a database that looks also at neighborhood, school, and patient level factors to try to understand how where you live affects what you eat, very simply, that's aim number three. So that's done, that's nearing completion, and here are some preliminary results. How am I doing on time? I guess time. All right, so here's the branch again, right? Heart of darkness, left ventricle. Um, what I looked at was 10 schools, 10 high schools in the Bronx. Um, and so these are not only schools, but they're also clinics because Montefiore uh, and in the Bronx, we have the largest school-based health um, program, uh, I think, in the country. Uh, and so each of the students that attend these schools are also patients. So I have student-level data and I have patient-level data. And we looked at the environment around their school. So we looked at the half mile, but not along some, you know, arbitrary circle or square or polygon, but we looked, you know, walking the streets. And so these are all different shapes because, you know, the streets are not a Cartesian grid. They're all kind of random, um, or not random, but in this prescribed order. Uh, and so we looked at these 10 different schools, and you can see there are kind of six schools over here in the left ventricle, and then these others over here, and so there's some pretty good variability there. Um, and so we walked the streets, and there are, you know, more than 1,500 street segments, so the, the um, a street between two cross streets, so those, uh, those um, linear distances. And we looked at all the food sources anywhere, so anything that was publicly available, so anything that uh, in this case, adolescents had access to, because that's the population of interest, so teenagers, high school students, uh, adolescent uh, clinic patients. Uh, and we categorize things as either food businesses, so the things that you expect to sell food, businesses where their primary focus is, uh, their, their primary business is about food distribution, so green cards, delis, restaurants, cafes, farmers markets, uh, and then other businesses. So businesses not primarily focused on food, but that might offer it anyway. So auto shops, laundromats, salons, et cetera. All right, and then we look at three different food categories. So, uh, sorry, four, uh, five different food categories, three healthful ones, so fruits and vegetables, whole grains and nuts. And then we have these two less healthful ones, so refined sweets and salty fatty fare. Uh, and the fine print here is all the details of what is an example and what is not an example. I don't expect you to look at that, I'm just to say, you know, we put some thought into this and we really considered what was what. Um, but I will say we were pretty generous here. Um, and, you know, even counting things like sandwich toppings, like lettuce and tomato on a uh, hamburger or, um, you know, toppings on a pizza or even like sweetened granola. So we really, you know, gave some leeway for the healthy stuff. Uh, and then we looked at drinks. So two helpful categories, water and milk, two less, uh, less helpful categories, sugar added drinks and alcohol. And then these two kind of neither helpful nor, you know, there's some debate in the literature. Some people will say juice is good. Some people will say diet drinks are good. Some people will say not. We're not going to resolve that uh, with this study. We're just going to categorize them as other. All right. So rather than making a giant table with the 10 different schools, what I'm just going to do is highlight the highest and lowest uh, values for each. So it turned out there were marked differences, right? So if we look at the map again, so school number 10 is over here. Uh, in the west, I'm sorry, in the east, uh, school number four is in the left ventricle, and you can see there's massive differences in the number of businesses around school, right? So like a five-fold difference. So 70 businesses around this school, you know, more than 350 around this school. Um, there were also big differences in the percentage of those businesses that were offering food or drink. So like in this area, for instance, 55%. So that means you could walk into any store, any door, and have greater than a coin flip's chance of finding food or beverage there. I think that's striking, right? I mean, any door, anywhere, any business, be it doctor's office, be it barbershop, be it hair salon, there's gonna be food or drink there. 
Um, oftentimes, so, you know, there were some helpful options, but again, we were generous, including like sweetened granola bars, sweetened cereal, you know, vanilla milk. I mean, we were pretty generous, so, you know, but it was out there. Um, but there were also big differences in stores that had no helpful options, that only sold less helpful stuff. Uh, and um, you can see that, that, that these are kind of examples of what that looks like, right? So not, not a lot of redeeming nutritional quality in any of this. Um, all right, now that's looking at all storefronts total. Now, if we subtract out the supermarkets and the fast food outlets and all the expected food sources and just look at other sources of food, we get these other businesses and there are big differences there too. So it turns out, you know, in some neighborhoods, other businesses represented by half of what's out there. So food stores and represent the other half. And in some it's as high as three quarters. Um, there are also big differences in the percentage of those other businesses offering food or drinks. So as much as a third in some areas where there's only like 10% in others. And these are examples of businesses that offered food or drink that you wouldn't expect. So auto shops, clothing stores, department stores, gyms, uh, newsstands, party supply stores, tobacco shops, toy stores. This is what it looks like on the street. So here's a barber shop or hair salon or someplace. I, you know, I don't have that problem, so I'm not really sure. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, sugar sweetened beverages. I think this got cut off in the image, but there's another vending machine here selling, you know, um, uh, chips and candy and stuff. Here's a laundromat, again, vending machine selling candy and chips and uh, I think sugary beverages. Uh, and this is, you know, this is just a tax place, right? A guy, this is like an accountant and financial services and they have an entire sweet shop inside. Like literally a built-in sweet shop where you can get cakes and cookies and coffee, you know, for free while you have your taxes done. Um, all right, now there, you know, there were some that offered helpful items too, and helpful options included things like, uh, you know, dried fruit and canned beans and granola and applesauce and, you know, seeds and trail mixes. This is what that looked like. So here, another hair salon barber shop, and they've got, you know, the sending machine full of peanuts, which I would consider a pretty healthy snack, actually. Um, here's a dollar store, 99 cent store, and actually a, a pretty extensive array of, you know, whole grain products and nuts. So that was surprising and cheerful, hopeful. Uh, this, do you guys have Marshalls here, DC? Yeah, so this is a Marshalls, and at the checkout, you know, lots of dried fruit, dried nuts, dried seeds. Uh, and then this is a pawn shop with a, um, you know, cart full of fresh plantains out front. So, you know, you don't, you, you can't, you, you couldn't invent this stuff, right? <laughs> um, all right, so offering only less helpful, there was, all right, so now, so that's, that's what it looked like on the street. Um, now we want to take that and look at it in the context of other school level data, neighborhood level data, um, and, you know, see what the associations are. We're just getting our feet into that. We're still collecting data. Like we want to get data on like crime from the New York uh, Depart uh, Police Department. We want to get our patient data from the EMR. We're pulling all that. So, you know, what we've got right now is just some early basic correlations with some things that we can pull from the Census Bureau and from the schools. Um, and so here are just some select uh, correlations that I pulled out of interest. So looking at school characteristics, there is less food or drink near schools with higher attendance rates for more Asian and white students. There are more businesses that offer only less helpful options around schools having more minority students. And there were fewer nuts, whole grains, and diet drinks around schools with more students in poverty. So those are correlations with school, school body characteristics. These are correlations with neighborhood characteristics. More businesses offered only less helpful items in neighborhoods with more Hispanic residents. Unhelpful food provision was correlated uh, with the percent of residents who were foreign born, and greater percent of businesses offered only less helpful drinks when uh, there were higher percentages of minority residents. Right, so not surprising and consistent with other things we found, and especially our data looking at um, food advertising in the subway system. Um, so it's not just the messages that are targeting uh, uh, vulnerable populations, I think, but also the food supply. Um, and so that's concerning. And so our conclusion so far is that, you know, food sources around schools include businesses well beyond food stores and restaurants. I think we've demonstrated that. I mean, the pictures alone tell that story. 
Um, and the extent and healthfulness of that food and drinks differs substantially um, by school and neighborhood characteristics. So there's, there's large heterogeneity even within the Bronx. Um, and I should say that that's dwarfed by the differences between the Bronx and Manhattan. So regardless of the variation within the Bronx, the variation between the Bronx and other boroughs or other locales is even more striking. Um, okay, so potential implications, what do we do with this? So, you know, I think it's important for physicians to better understand the context in which their patients live and maybe even create opportunities for advocacy. So not all of you are involved in research. Many of you are involved in patient care. Um, some of you want to be engaged in work outside of clinic walls, and this is an opportunity to do that if you have the information that can, um, you know, help support helpful policy change, like the, you know, the information that we did on the food advertising did, right? So that just happened to be the right information at the right time that could support a campaign that was moving forward. Um, businesses, so this, you know, whoops, back, back, well, what did I do? There we go. Um, so the food is already out there. I don't think we're gonna take it back in. I don't think we're gonna restrict food. I think that's a losing strategy. But what we might do is like all the places that are offering food now, like they don't have to sell all only unhealthful garbage, right? They might increase, uh, they might change their inventories and make it you know, more friendly to people's health and weight, right? So maybe instead of offering just sugary drinks and chips and soda uh, or candy, you know, maybe they offer some nuts or some dried fruit or you know, some trail mix or something like that. Uh, I've been logged off a device. That's unfortunate. Well, that's fine because this is boring statistics and nobody wants to look at that. So that's just kind of the um, hierarchical model. Boring. Moving on. Uh, and I can't read that now. So, uh, so this is cross-sectional um, work, right? So right now we're just looking at what the food environment looks like and what the characteristics of the neighborhoods and schools are. Now, ultimately, this leads to longitudinal work. So I want to look at changes in the food environment and how that leads to changes in what kids are eating and what they look like in terms of diet-related health outcomes. So lipids, sugar, blood pressure, uh, weight, right? Um, and so that's the next steps and what I'm hoping to do um, to inform, oh, I, that's all I had to do? <laughs> <laughs> so embarrassing. <laughs> all right, anyway, so that's it anyway. So I'm gonna leave it here. So these are all the many people, organizations, institutions, and others I would like to thank. Uh, and I'm going to especially highlight the people in these box in this box because these are all the students that um, you know I mentioned at the beginning what would you do if you wanted to look at the food environment efficiently and maybe not leave your office. I never leave my office except when I come here to give talks. But like these are these are the students that are out on the street, like doing the hard work, sweating and taking pictures, and you know I'm just kind of uh, operating remote. So that's all I've got. Uh, that's my email down there. I'm happy. You know I have a I have a a hospital and med school account too, but I tend to prefer that one. So Dan always gives me gives me grief for that. Anyway, that is all. Yeah. There was an article in the LA Times in the beginning of February that was also trying to just acknowledge that food desert research is kind of all over the board. And the author didn't really delve into his as much as you did, and then she hypothesized that, and this was based on data, that parents of the lower socioeconomic brackets, when their kids want things like a trip to Disneyland yeah, or I saw that. shoes, they, they have to constantly decline these requests, and the only way they feel they can emotionally nourish their kids is by saying yes to junk food yeah. versus higher socioeconomic brackets. They feel comfortable saying no to these requests like 95% of the time because they can afford to say yes to Disney yeah. their shoes. I thought that was super interesting, just wondering. Yeah, that, that, and that's a great encapsulation of that study. That was like a super succinct summary. You should do that for a living, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's exactly what it showed. Yeah, and so it gets to the point that this is all very complex, right? So I'm operating uh, on the environmental context and changing the field, but there are also these other drivers, right? So people's psychology and what people are thinking about it, and I'm not operating at that level, but that's, you know, very important, right? And so, like, even if you make a change in the environment, it's not going to affect all people equally and for that very reason. But that said, you can make helpful food more, make it, you know, so the kids are wanting it for some reason. Oftentimes it's because it's emblazoned with a cartoon character. It's, you know, made to look attractive in some other way that, you know, draws them to it that has nothing to do with the product itself, but just the targeted marketing that's manipulating them. So, but that's an excellent point. Yeah. New York City is thought of, whether it's true or not, as a hyper-regulated place. 
you know, it's blue yeah. state, blue city, right? And government has huge roles. So right. what's the role of government in regulating not only the food places in terms of what they sell, but the non-food places? In terms of Wouldn't that be an avenue to try to make change? It is. I'm always skeptical of uh, government regulation. I mean, I, maybe that's partly political bias, um, but I. Um, so you know, there's always unintended consequences with any policy, right? Uh, the green cards may be one example. So um, the green cards are actually a government policy, which I think is good and I think is a positive direction moving forward. What we've, what they showed with the green cards, or what they demonstrated at least in a uh, brief report that wasn't, um, you know, further expanded on, but they showed that by putting street vendors out there selling fresh fruits and vegetables, not only did it directly increase access to fruits and vegetables through the green cards. But it also changed um, community norms and the business environment so that uh, it actually increased consumer demand so that surrounding businesses also started offering fruits and vegetables. So it's like a more global um, translation of that work, right? And so, um, so I think there can be, you know, and that wasn't an expected consequence, and that was a happy consequence. Now, sometimes they have, um, you know, they, um, there are regulations or policies that put in place that are well-meaning and well-intended that have the opposite effect. And I'm trying to think, um, you know, I'm going to talk to Dan, Dan's class about some of the, you know, specifically nutrition-related one related to people's diet. I'm trying to think in the food environment. Um, well, but the thing in the reg in the regulation business, for instance, yeah, uh, they tell the green cards what they can sell and what they can't sell. Yes, so green cards can only sell whole, fresh, unprocessed produce currently. And so that was one thing we found in our study is that not all green cards are complying with that. Now they can be fined and fined substantially. Uh, most of these vendors are uh, foreign born immigrants, not a lot of uh, English proficiency, not a lot of business skill and um, not a lot of income. And so, you know, a, 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 even a small financial penalty can hurt quite a bit. Um, and so that, that's an issue. Mostly when we looked, they were complying and were, uh, you know, adhering to the policies, but that wasn't the case across the board. Um, that said, when we looked at um, street vending more generally, so green cards are a very small minority of all the, all the vendors out there, and the sanctioned vendors are, are a very small minority of the vendors that are out there. So only about a third of all the vendors that we looked at had some kind of permit or license or were known by the city. A lot of it was informal distribution. So people selling watermelons out of the side of a van or mangoes out of the back of a car or someone who just set up a blanket with, you know, fruit they had purchased somewhere else. So, um, you know, it's kind of the wild west out there. And yeah, I mean, I think regulation can be helpful, but I don't know that's the only answer. I think, um, yeah, I think government and also academic health centers and physicians and that, you know, paper that I put up uh, as sort of my second slide that came out was about how physicians and health centers can be more involved in this work and working out into the community. And some of the strategies we talk about are like working with local owners to modify their inventory, doing walks in the community to show them where they can get healthy food, um, you know, supporting um, local businesses or, or local um, uh, street vendors and that kind of thing. So I, I think there, there are options out there that may even be based um, uh, in the business uh, communities, like operating with the, with the people who are selling in the community. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the, in the green. Green first, and then we'll go to the back. Thanks. Um, since this is such a social justice issue, so yeah. what about um, partnering with community advocacy groups, immigrant advocacy yeah. groups? That's something. That's huge. And uh, particularly for the green carts and the street vendors, that's enormous. And in fact, um, you know, I, I just submitted a piece recently. Uh, I, so, um, I was a, re a reviewer on a systematic review looking at street vending uh, in general and health outcomes related to it. And the editor invited me to write a piece about my perspective on street vending. And I made that case in the article. And in fact, I sent it to uh, the Street Vendor Project of New York, which is a, an advocacy group, a, um, a, a, a consumer, uh, 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 a group of business owners and consumers, a community group that support street vendors. So I sent them the manuscript to say, hey, do you have any additions? Do you have any other ideas? You know, what's your thinking on this? But there's definitely effort out there um, and movement afoot to engage these communities and community organizations to help solve this problem. Yeah, uh, in the back uh, behind the green, sorry. I just wanted to remark, I guess, uh, that 
the Bronx in the research, like the picture of painting looks a lot like uh, towns in rural Nicaragua and like Central America. Yeah. Can you explain what I'm saying? Like, uh, when you go there, you can see like tourism affluence um, being kind of um, shown through selling lots of cheap snacks, manufactured from corn, sure. soy, cane sugar, stuff like that. And I feel like the Nicaraguans aren't making that stuff for themselves. It's being sold to them by international corporations. Yeah. And they're making it cheaply because of the way our government subsidizes those forms of industrial agriculture. Right. So I think like like if you go and say to these local businesses, these are like homegrown businesses in the Bronx, they're like, well, I can sell this cheaply. I can't sell, I can't buy produce cheaply because of the choices we've made at the national level to subsidize crappy food. Right. So I don't think that like working with them on the ground necessarily is gonna solve their basic bottom line business problem, which is no one in America can buy healthy food cheaply because we don't subsidize it. So there, no question there are greater food system issues and I appreciate the comment. Um, I will say that um, interestingly, we just had um, the uh, dean from a med school of Chile come and visit Einstein. He was very interested in this work, and we were hoping to maybe export that out to the um, you know Chilean communities, um, which are you know as you know having kind of the same situation going on. Um, that said, you know there are definitely strong corporate forces at play here. We're definitely exporting our unhealthy dietary behaviors, products, and um, uh, diet-related health issues. Um, in regard to um, business redesign, so it's a complicated issue, but for instance, one of the people I thank here is uh, the Food Trust. So they're uh, based in Philadelphia. And when I was there, um, you know, so it's not just a supply side issue, it's also a demand issue. And so one thing that the Food Trust did was work not only in bodegas to help redesign um, their offerings or help change their offerings or make them more helpful, but also working in the schools to help introduce kids to foods they might not be familiar with and show them that they like it and incentivize them to want to purchase it, right? So a lot of it is just about changing these food ways and making people, uh, giving people exposure to things they wouldn't otherwise have access to. Um, you made a point about, uh, there were a bunch of things I wanted to say about, um, what was your other point about uh, the businesses? Just that, well, the, the thing I keep thinking is like to buy bulk Cheetos is probably super cheap. Oh, right, right. Sorry, yeah, the, that was the other thing I want to say. So, so we've actually demonstrated, and, and, there, and I can send you the links to some studies. So, so it's, uh, there, there's no question that, um, you know, highly palatable, unhelpful food is, you know, subsidized and cheaply available. That said, it is not necessarily more expensive to eat healthily, at least in terms of dollars and cents. So like, you know, a bag of lentils, a bag of beans, brown rice. I mean, you could, you know, you can get these for pennies. Where the cost comes in is in terms of like preparation time, convenience issues, and those kind of things. And that's, you know, another issue that has to be addressed. And, and you know, and there are organizations that are addressing it, both community organizations, academic centers, faith-based organizations. So there are community kitchens where people get together like once a week and cook, and they make big volumes that they can have all week, and then that, you know. Uh, has multiple benefits, but in addition, takes down some of the inconvenience factor and gives them other benefits in addition to it. Um, so I will say, you know, the, the economics of it are complicated. I mean, there are certain, certainly studies that have demonstrated that you can eat healthfully cheaply, but I think, you know, one of the things you have to factor in is the convenience factor and the cost and the familiarity and people's cultural traditions and their cooking ways and their, you know, food preparation knowledge and it's, it's tricky issues, but your points are well taken. Uh, a question. The first comment for the students and the residents, I think even if they're not interested in what he does, um, the way he does it and asks looks at simple questions and questions it is so important for any field you go into because there's so much. I've been, I've been doing a study for orthopedists where they just assume things that are just so not true, and, and you do a great job. Really appreciate that. Thanks. But my my question is, you know, I have problems with with non RCTs, and my problem is that when you get to the actual, you're gonna look at their outcomes. My take on all this is that poor people always do worse, sure. no matter what you do. So how do you take it? You can't just simply adjust for that because it doesn't get to that. How do you no, really it, take so, that so they always do worse, but we want to help them do better, right? So we want to make it so they do less worse. So there's less discrepancy, less disparity. 
right? So uh, my slide got cut off by that, you know, blurb that came up. But like ultimately, you know, I want to lead to interventional sites. So I want to do an RCT, right? So like this gives us an idea of what to operate on. My thinking is that it's going to be mobile vending. Like that's the way to go. And then it's just like randomizing into a neighborhood. So like, yes, fast food is here. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Well, what if we put like a guy selling like, you know, kid friendly, highly palatable, you know, uh, fruit snacks or something, like actual fruit, you know, like fruit cut up into fun shapes or fruit, whatever. What if we put them there and sort of, uh, you know, uh, detract from some of that other uh, unhelpful food exposure and we can make it affordable and we can make it palatable and we can make it available and make it, you know, something that kids want. Maybe that will be helpful. I don't know. I mean, so like, you know, there, there are, there are certainly pathways to randomize this, right. And to try things and to see if they work. And one of the points I made in that, uh, you know, invited piece I wrote on food vending is that it's, in, it's incredibly flexible. A lot of the other options that people have looked at, like there's a whole, um, um, uh, fast, uh, fresh food financing initiative, which is about getting supermarkets into these, you know, needy communities. And that often doesn't do well. And bodega redesign often doesn't do well. And restricting uh, fast food often doesn't do well. But these are things that require, you know, a lot of uh, political will and corporate buy-in and space and capital. And there are kind of permanent fixes that aren't adaptable, right, in real time. They're not flexible. But a food vendor, like a mobile vendor, can try selling here. And if it doesn't work, he can go somewhere else. Or he or she can go somewhere else. Or they can, you know, try a different product or use a different line. And it's much more flexible and adaptable and I think has a lot more promise to change and I think is something that you know we can leverage in terms of you know looking for solutions but but I you know to your point I agree I mean like you know so you don't get the answer from looking at operational studies but you can point out deficiencies in other people's answers by looking at observational studies which is kind of where this is at this point so I think a lot of what's out there is just nonsense and the literature is entirely contaminated with I don't want to, I think I'm being recorded, so I'm going to choose my words. <laughs> Not good stuff. Others? Good? Thanks, guys. This is fun. Uh, all docs, please sign in to get credit. Yeah, what do I do? Right, this guy takes care of All right. Students, right. please sign in to get credit. Hey, Dan, what, is someone going to come get me, or do I? Right in there. Are you going to bring me to your butt? I'm going to add E201. Next. Where are we going next?